All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you. I think that was Christine. Thank you. I appreciate that. I love that. Um, well, church, good morning. My name is uh, Noah. Ooh, some feedback. It's all good. We'll figure it out. Uh, my name is Pastor Noah. I serve at our Park Community Church, Hyde Park Church. It's funny. Like, Kenson and I worked out the schedule for him to preach at Hyde Park this Sunday and me to come here. And uh, it happened to be where South was gathered here. And so super excited to be able to share the word of God with you all. Uh, yeah, we've been, our church started about two years ago. It'll be two years for us, uh, I guess, next month for Hyde Park. And so, uh, yeah, yeah, we're still here. Thank you for that. Yeah. I uh, appreciate all of your, many of you know the, the journey of that and uh, have been praying for us, been supporting us from afar. And so me and our, uh, our small, humble church, we're, we're grateful for just the family that we have. And even as you guys see here, as Rafe hosted and Kenton helping out at Hyde Park and the leaders here and I'm preaching here, like we're, we're a family and that's actually a really amazing gift and privilege for us. And so thank you so much for, uh, for that. But now, we're going to continue our sermon series uh, in Great Stories, which are stories from the Old Testament. And so turn with me to Genesis 32. Genesis chapter 32. Um, and as a reminder, the reason why we're going through these great stories in Scripture is because as we deep, uh, delve deep into these stories of these characters of the Bible and see how God works, how he has shaped people and corrected people and loved people and rescued people. It also gives us a perspective and a glimpse and how God does that in our lives too. And so before we look into this story and say like, oh, this is just a story that happened like 4,000 years ago. No, I want you to actually put yourself in this story just a little bit. I want you to uh, see how God can also do the same things in these people's lives as yours. And so we're going to be in Genesis chapter 32 and look at the story of Jacob, or well, a part of his story, part of the story of Jacob. And he's probably the only history, a person in history who has physically wrestled with God. And so let's go to chapter 32, verses 22, and I'll read through verses 32 from the ESV. It reads, The same night he arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the uh, Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And the man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of the joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed them. So Jacob called the name the place Penel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. Let me pray. Father, we come before you today at your word, um, and I pray, O oh God, that as I just, as we read and as we sung, God, I pray that you would ultimately be glorified, that you would point us more and more to you through this story. I pray for uh, even myself that the words that I say that are of me would be forgotten, but that are of you would be remembered, that would be planted in good soil. And I pray, God, that our hearts would be ready to receive your word and that it would not, we would not just be hearers of your words, but doers of your words as we go out into our lives, our workplaces, our families, our neighborhoods, our city, God, our world, uh, to make you known and to glorify you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, before I get to the story, I want to talk about or answer this one question. Who is Jacob? Who is Jacob? And so before we get to this one-on-one -on -one showdown that Jacob has with God, like, who is he? Let's begin. I mean, you don't have to turn there, but I'm going to go through this history. Jacob's story begins in Genesis chapter 25, and he is born as a set of twins. He comes out of his mother's womb by grasping his brother Esau's heel. And his name, Jacob's name, literally means in Hebrew, grabber of heel, or another way to translate it, is the one who cheats or deceives. 
And right from the start, that theme really sets the tone for his entire story. But the first act of deception happens when Jacob cunningly swindles his brother Esau out of his birthright. You know, it's true that in the story, Esau was kind of foolish here to trade his birthright. You know, this birthright that was double as the firstborn. But he, you know, but Jacob seizes that opportunity without hesitation. Then, the, then it makes, uh, it kind of makes us wonder if Jacob did this out of spite and jealousy. Then it gets worse. Then Jacob tricks his dying, nearly blind father, Isaac, into giving him Esau's blessing. He disguises himself and he, he lies convincingly, claiming to, his, to be his brother, and he takes the blessing that wasn't his for himself. Esau, upon learning of the deception, he's heartbroken and he's filled with resentment and anger. And if you jump to Genesis 27, you will read this aftermath. And let me just read it for you, and I have it on the screen. It says, but he, Isaac, the father, said, your brother came deceitfully and he has taken away your blessing. Esau said, is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has cheated me these two times. He took away my birthright and behold, now he has taken away my blessing." Then he said, have you not reserved the blessing for me? Isaac answered and said to Esau, behold, I have made him Lord over you and all his brothers. I have given to him for servants and with grain and wine I have sustained him. What then can I do for you, my son? And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Verse 41, now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which he, his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are approaching. Then I will kill my brother, Jacob. So as a result, what happens? Jacob, he runs. He runs away. He gets away from his home, and he runs to his uncle, Laban. And there, his story continues, and it's kind of like a love story now. He meets the most beautiful woman in the world, or girl in the world, and it's love at first sight. And it's not like today, though. You don't just go over and ask her on a date, or you just don't put a ring on it. What he does is he has to go to her father, Laban, and he has to work for seven years for the girl of his dreams. And after seven hard years, he, he works, and it finally happens. But the morning after the wedding night, Jacob wakes up in his tent, and it's not Rachel, the woman of his dreams, next to him. It's Leah, his, or her older sister. And obviously, like any person, Jacob would be furious that he has been tricked. And it's ironic, though, because Jacob is kind of getting the taste of his own medicine of being tricked himself. And he was in incredibly upset. And he confronts his uncle. And then Laban tells him that, hey, it's not right for me to marry off my younger daughter before my older daughter. And so what Jacob does, he works seven more years for Rachel's hand in marriage. And through the next many years, Jacob his, and, and, and his family and his possessions, remember, God blessed him. And so it's growing exponentially. He has... He has many kids, he has, uh, he has many possessions, many flock, ma many resources, many female, male servants. And so when Laban saw this, Laban was no fool either. He's like, everything Jacob touches prospers. And so time and time again, what Laban does is he tricks Jacob. He tricks Jacob for staying with him. And so that when Jacob gets blessed, Laban gets blessed too. Now, Jacob wasn't stupid either. He's seeing what Laban is doing. He's seeing the trickery happening. And so then it's this game of deception happening back and forth, back and forth, uncle deceiving nephew, and they're using each other for their own gain. And then eventually Jacob gets fed up, and he runs away from Laban, taking all his family and possessions. And Laban eventually catches up, and by, you know, I'm making this long story short, he, they reconcile, and Jacob finally gets to go back home. Now, let me just kind of read the, the summary of one scholar, how he puts this end of this chapter of Jacob's life. It reads, over and over again, promises were made and then broken. Wages were set and then changed. Demands were made, then changed, then made again. Many were the days when Jacob wondered if he would ever go home again. But now at last he is free of Laban. The long humiliation is over. The lessons learned and the payment made. The hard times in Haran are but a distant memory. He is almost home again. So Jacob's story is coming back forward. But remember here, there's one issue with going back home. He's got to face Esau. He's got to face the one person he's deceived and stole from and who's the one who wants to kill him. And so now we find ourselves, and this is what happens, all that's happened, and then we get to chapter 32. 
And in chapter 32, if you look with me in verses 3 to 5, you see here that Jacob knows that he needs to make amends. And so he sends his servants to find out and tell Esau that I have made it. I have made it. I have donkeys and oxen and flocks and male and female servants. Please let me find favor in your eyes. And then look at verse 6. It reads, And the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to your brother Esau, and he is coming to meet you. And there are 400 men with him. Verse 7, Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. At that moment, Jacob was so afraid that everything that he had schemed for and worked for and earned could be gone in a flash. So I circle back to the original question. Who is Jacob? Who is Jacob? I believe Jacob is someone who is constantly living in fear. He is constantly living in fear. Or another way to say it, I think, is he has FOMO. Now, FOMO is kind of a popular term that came out actually all the way back in, 20, in 2004. And it's, it means the fear of missing out. And it's kind of when social media came to, came to popularity and to rise. And it's this idea, and for Jacob, I think, it's, it's when people, it's when he saw, like for, for FOMO in our day and age, it's like when people see other people hanging out or having the vacation or having the lifestyle that other people have on social media, so they're trying to do their best to like stay connected and like try to have that same experience because they don't want to miss out. But for Jacob here, I think what happens is that out of that fear of missing out, out of that fear of missing out on that birthright or that blessing or that new life or that specific wife or the wealth and prosperity that he, that he just longed for, his fear of missing out resulted in him chasing and striving for all the things that he couldn't get and that he didn't have. And so you saw Jacob was, u- was using his deception and trickery to get what he didn't have. Out of fear, fear was motivating him. And this is why Jacob was the self-made man that we see throughout his story. He turned his FOMO into motivation to get what he wanted. But then, at this moment with Esau, he knew that it was all in jeopardy and it, would, it could easily have just been taken away in a flash. Now, this is Jacob's story, and I did a long intro because we need to understand before Jacob wrestles with God, what happens beforehand. And let's, but for us, as we look at this story, let's take a moment and step back and look at our own lives just for a moment here and ask ourselves, what do I fear most? What do I fear of missing out on? What am I striving for that is out of my own fear? Is it the fear of not being wanted or not getting the approval of others that I want? Is it the fear of not finding the companionship and fulfillment and relationships that I want? Is it the fear of not achieving the comfort or prestige or wealth that I want? Is it the fear of not being good enough at church or before other colleagues or my family that I can't get? Is it the fear of forever being stuck, purposeless, or in pain, or in sin. What do you fear most? The reality is that like Jacob, I believe, I honestly believe all of us, that there is a brokenness in our stories that cause us to live more out of fear than anything else. And we'll use deception like Jacob. We'll use our sheer effort like Jacob, or whatever we can to get it. And that is the story of many people living, not just, you know, here, but in our city and in our world. But what we see in Genesis 32, in this story, is how God addresses Jacob's fear and he doesn't leave him. Instead, God brings him to his breaking point so that he would not live in constant fear, but have a deep confidence rooted in God. So today, what I want to do is I want to share three ways God transforms our stories of fear into stories of confidence, how God transforms our stories of fear into stories of confidence. And the first way that we see it in this story here is, number one, God empties you. God empties you, just like Jacob. In verse 7, and this is kind of before our text that I read, but just look with, look with me here. 
kind of summarizing, what happens is that Jacob is afraid. He is deathly afraid. And so he divides his camps into two camps. And so in case Esau attacks one camp, the other camp can run away. But then look in verse 9 to 12. You know, I, I, there's a prayer here. And let me actually read this prayer. And just instead of, like, understanding the words of the prayer, just feel the emotions of this prayer. Jacob said in verse 9, And God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, Return to your country and to your kindred that I may do you good. I am not worthy of the least of all the deeds of steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. For with only my staff I crossed this Jordan, and now I have become two camps. Please deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him that he may come and attack me, the mothers with the children. But you said, I, sh I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. I can preach, you know, there can be a sermon on this prayer, but just Jake, uh, uh, for, for, uh, for Jacob here, just understand and feel the emotion behind the words here. It's one of desperation, of agony, of pleading, of emptiness, that he is nowhere else to turn but to God. Jacob was utterly powerless to save him or his family, and so he goes to God in prayer. But then what happens in verse 32 to 21, it's kind of interesting here, because maybe he got impatient, but what he does is he begins to line up this gift of parades for Esau. He has goats, rams, camels, cows, bulls, donkeys, and, and more. And it's like what Jacob is doing. He's preparing a gift for Esau with the most expensive goods in that time and in that age. It's like if he lined up a Ferrari, a, a cart with like fine jewelry, another cart with like expensive wine and caviar and Wagyu steaks, and then like a cart of gold at the end. Like it's that, that's like what he's doing here. He's lining this up so that maybe Esau would be okay with Jacob and stealing all his birthright and his blessings. Maybe if he can give him this enormous, luxurious gift, then maybe Esau will be okay. He'll be, he won't kill Jacob. And then what's interesting, in our text, when we get to verse 22 to 23, what happens then after he lands up that gift, then what he does is he takes his family and the rest of his possessions across the ford, and he sends them across the stream, and then he stays back. And verse 24 says, Jacob was left alone. But just kind of for your picture here, what's happening is first, Jacob has this gift, this line of luxurious gifts. Then there's this ford, and Jacob's on the other side. He sends his family to kind of be behind the gifts. And then Jacob, there's this ford, there's this stream. Jacob is here behind that. And so what's happening is he's putting every single element before him so that Esau might be tempered and not kill Jacob, even his own family before him. And Jacob is left alone and behind the stream and behind the ford. He was... There's, he's put everything he could before him so that maybe something before him could save his life. But what does that do? That leaves Jacob by himself all alone in the middle of the night. And if I were to guess, it left him utterly empty. And I, I imagine Jacob thinking, like, what is all, what's, what's the point of all this? I earned all of this, but it could be taken away. My life could be taken away. What's the point of gaining this birthright and blessing all just for my brother to take revenge on me? And I imagine he's probably at his breaking point in this moment. What is God doing here for Jacob? You know, this reminds me a little bit about gardening or lawn care. Now, I'm no garden expert, and I can't even maintain a small little plot of grass in my own townhouse. You can see it actually on the screen here. Um, I, I can't even do a good job maintaining that. And, you know... As a homeowner now, like you, as a, you would like that plot of grass to be nice, right? But uh, when it didn't rain for like three weeks, I don't even remember that, that, that time of the year, like it was disgusting looking. It was yellow, like no one looked like they lived there. It was pretty bad. And now though, because it's rained a lot, what's happened is that it's not yellow anymore. It's just full of weeds. <laughs> and for me, it's kind of hard because some of our neighbors take care of their lawns and it's like really nice and like immaculate. Ours is not. And so I'm like trying to fix it and trying to do it. And I, so I'm researching here like, how do you get weeds out of lawn, all right? I'm like a city guy now, so I don't know what to do. And so I'm looking at the advice online, and almost every single advice or blog or whatever you want to call it, what they say is the best way to get rid of weeds that are in your lawn is to roll up your sleeves, 
to get deep in those roots and to take, pull those suckers out one by one. First of all, I don't got time for that. I don't want to do that. I don't have time for this. And then second, like, why can't I just spray a bunch of chemicals? And maybe there are some chemicals. Maybe I just don't know about it. But why can't I just spray a bunch of, like, weed killer on this? But then I learned that if you do that, you're going to kill the grass, too. So I probably shouldn't do that. The only way was to patiently, carefully isolate the, the weeds and dig them out by hand. Only then could you get them out. And, and most likely, it's going to do some damage to the grass. It's going to be painful for the lawn. But that's the only way for the lawn to be green and healthy again. And I thought about that a little bit because I, I think for, for us and even for Jacob here, I, I feel like God's doing something similar in Jacob's heart. I feel like for God, he is, what he's doing is he sees all the clutter, all the crutches that's crowding Jacob's heart. And he needs Jacob to be exposed and empty. But he needs to, also, he needs to do that by digging out those weeds in his heart. God can't tend the garden in Jacob's heart without first de-weeding the idols and the fears that were rooted so deeply in his heart. And so in the same way, I want to ask you all, what kinds of weeds are cluttering your heart right now? What does God need to de-weed one by one? God can't address you. He can't transform you. He can't change you unless he begins to do the hard work of decluttering and de-weeding the various idols and crutches that are in your heart. And he just wants you. He wants you exposed so that when you're vulnerable, when you're empty, when you're naked, like Jacob here in this moment, God can begin the work of transformation in your heart. So then what happens when Jacob encounters God one-on-one, -on -one, empty, with God, this leads me to my second way. God invites you to wrestle with him. God invites you to wrestle with him. In verse 24, we see that Jacob wrestles with this man until the breaking of the day, literally all night. Now, just picture me with you. This is not like WWE wrestling, like on the screen you see here. It's not like chairs flying and people jumping off. This is not that kind of wrestling here, okay? The word literally in Hebrew means grappling, and it's the only time used in scripture, and it's grappling, not just to kind of like play grappling, but it's like grappling someone to destroy them. This is literally a fight. This is not like a casual wrestling, like kids wrestling around. This is a fight. Now, there are questions all over commentaries on who this man is. Some say angel, some say, you know, other things. I, I, I think, I personally believe that it's God, because Jacob calls this place where he literally encounters the face of God. So I'm just going to stick with it there. Um, but what we see here, and I think it's really important to notice, is that God isn't afraid to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Jacob. And honestly, Jacob isn't afraid to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with this man as well. And then in verse 25, you see what happens is that when the man did not prevail against Jacob, he touched, or another translation could be he struck Jacob's hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of place, but yet Jacob still held on, and this man says, let me go for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. What's happening here is that Jacob begins to see. Now, when it's night, you have to remember here, it's pitch black. Jacob probably has no idea who this man is. So it's pitch black, but then when, when the morning sun begins to rise, Jacob probably notices that this man is not an ordinary man. And so he's not letting go. And he knows that this has to be, he has to be someone divine, someone who is probably, probably God himself. And so for Jacob, it's no matter how much pain he is in right now, he is not letting go. He is seeking out God. He is holding on to God in the most desperate time of his life. He is seeking out God's blessing. I will not let you go until you bless me. And you know, what I find so interesting in this exchange is that if this man was truly God or even an angel, Jacob would have stood no chance with this man or someone who is as strong as God or as an angel. Because even the unfailing, if you see in scripture, the unveiling of God's face could have struck Jacob down and killed him right there. It's like if I was wrestling my one-year-old son, Ezra, and as much as he's adorable and cute, if he had a one-on-one -on -one wrestling match with dad, dad's going to win, all right? It's, I'm just going to be clear, dad's going to win. So I actually find this wrestling match comforting, a little bit reassuring. 
Because you have to imagine Jacob, who has gone through the worst possible day of his life. He's angry. He's frustrated. He's desperate for help. And he has no idea what's going to happen in the morning. But God, getting, after getting Jacob all alone, God meets him. And God lets Jacob express his anger and frustration in a physical wrestling match. And instead of overpowering him, like God could have easily said, Jacob, learn your lesson here. I'm way stronger than you. I'm in control. Just submit to my will and know your place. Instead, what God does is he wrestles with him. And I would say probably gently wrestles with him, minus the hip dislocation. Um, He wrestles with him. And he lets Jacob express his emotions, his pain, his frustration. God lets Jacob struggle with him. Why? God is not afraid of our frustrations. God is not afraid of our questions, our struggles, our fears. God is not even afraid to fight us or enter into an argument with us. In fact, he wants you to. He invites you to. Because sometimes the only way to get through a stubborn, prideful person like Jacob or even like you and me, living in fear, going the wrong way, is to fight with them and to argue with them straight on. You know, this scene reminds me a little bit about um, a a scene in a popular TV show called The Office. I don't know if you guys are all Office fans here. I am. But uh, it's towards the end of the long series in The Office where Jim and Pam, the kind of the main couple in the show, like they've gone through a lot. In the part of the season, they're in a really rough patch in their marriage. With kids, with Jim having a job so it's in some other city, there's like many tears and many arguments that they've had in the show. And in this scene, it's Valentine's Day. And Jim tells Pam he wants to go back to Philly because he does not want to fight again. He's sick of fighting. And then Pam says to Jim, I don't think you should go to Philly tonight. I think you should stay, and I think we should fight. And Jim says, you really want to fight on Valentine's Day? And Pam responds, yeah, I do. And this scene hits home for me, and maybe some of you too as well, because I know in my dating um, dating life with my wife now, and even our marriage life, we fought a lot, and we still fight. We have a lot of arguments here. At first, you know, in the beginning of our relationship, I thought, man, like, are we so incompatible? Like, why do we argue so much? Why do we fight so much? Well, I learned because we're so different people. We're so different. We have different uh, views. We're, we're changing. We're, we're arguing about different. We're trying to understand each other. And, and after a lot of fights and some mentoring and um, growing and maturing and having better, uh, you know, times to forgive and to listen to one another, I realized that in those fights, when resolved and done in a healthy manner, it led to good fruit. It led to a better understanding between one another. It led to us knowing how to love one another better, how to serve one another, how to understand one another as we're growing in this relationship. It isn't easy, it's not, it's not even pretty, but fighting brought us to our senses. It made us deal with who we really are and engage honestly with the other person and who they are. Sometimes a fight was the only way for us to truly understand one another. Now, in our relationship with God, like in our relationship with God, that's not, it's not this, there's similarity, but it's not the same. God is perfect. He's not sin. There's no sin in him. He's not unrighteous. He knows us perfectly. But God knows that sometimes we just need to hash it out with him. We need to wrestle with him. We need to expose everything that we have. We need to throw everything at him. And can I just tell you, church, I don't know how you've grown up in the church or maybe this is your first time at church, but God can take any question, any frustration, any fear, and he invites you to do so. He won't strong arm you or overpower you even, but I believe our God will invite you to wrestle with you. And in the end, it's because God wants you to slowly understand him. He wants to get rid of that pride, that stubbornness, and he wants you to understand him so that you can begin to change. And only in our desperation, only if we're holding on to him and clinging on to him like Jacob, when we are going toe-to-toe with him, can God go toe-to-toe with us and he can bring his children to some, to, to a better sense. And it's the only, and I believe it's one of the ways that God encounters us. 
Now, what happens after this encounter? What happens when Jacob finally wrestles with God and God then blesses him? This leads me to my third way. God gives you a new name. God gives you a new name. In verse 27, God asks Jacob, what is your name? Obviously, he knows his name, but Jacob says, Jacob. And which literally means, Jacob is saying, I am the one who deceives and cheats. And in verse 28, God gives Jacob a new name, Israel, which in Hebrew, as explained in the text, is the one who strives our struggles with God. And what's interesting here is in this exchange is that in verse 29, Jacob asks God, what is your name? And God doesn't respond to that. Um, and it's weird because in ancient times, and actually in a lot of cultures even today, it's impolite to ask someone who is above you their name. But for Jacob here, I feel like there's this, there's this desperation, there's this desire to be intimate with God and to know what he desires. But God doesn't give his name. God does that later actually with Moses. But God blesses Israel, or Jacob, right here. And in this exchange, God acknowledges that you will not be the same person anymore. The one who deceives will now become the one who struggled with God and prevailed, again, prevailed and will be blessed by him. And this is so important to Jacob's story because he doesn't deceive his way to get this. He doesn't trick anyone to get God's blessing here or work for seven years to get it. He was losing this wrestling match, but yet it was freely given to him in his defeat. Only because of God's grace did Jacob receive a new name and receive the blessing from him. Did you know that in church history, and this is a practice we don't do today, but many, many believers, when they were baptized, like we did about a few weeks ago, they would be actually given a Christian name as a symbol of their new identity in Christ. And this would symbolize that they had left their old ways and are now in Christ. And they, hear me, they didn't just pick a random name from a book. They didn't just look online and find a, a name online. What they would do is they'd have people over them who would pray over them that would be their mentors and leaders. And they would choose a name to confirm the new identity and purpose for the rest of one's life. And that's the name they took on afterwards. And it was a symbol of God's grace upon their lives. And that's what happened to Jacob. Grace, God's grace, transformed his life. And if you go to the next chapter, in chapter 33, you already see a new person. Look with me in verse 1. It says, And Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau was coming, and 400 men with him. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two female servants, and he put the servants with the children in front, then Leah with her children, and Rachel with Joseph last of all. He himself went on before them, bowing himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. Verse 4, but Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Instead of standing at the back of the line, Jacob goes all the way to the front and faces his brother first, bowing in humility. At this point, Jacob was no longer afraid, or Israel was no longer afraid. He was ready to humbly accept his consequence. And by God's mercy, instead of a fight with his brother, there is this warm embrace. And from then on, in chapter 33 and onward, you see a man who is now more humble, who is more generous, and worshipful than he ever used to be, all because he encountered God. You know, there is way more in this story that I could ever cover. You can be a whole class even. And I flew by some sections. But I want us to marinate on this last point here. I want us to see how much when we encounter God, God can transform our fear, our stories of fear, and even transform a deceitful man like Jacob. And the reality is that many of us right now are living with the names that we cannot stand, like Jacob. We are living with names, whether it's given to you by the world, whether it's given to you by others, or by your own conscience, or the evil one himself. These are names that you are being called right now. You are being called worthless. You are being called used. 
You are being called broken. You're a failure. You're an addict. You're weak. You're ugly. You're dumb. You're pathetic. You're hopeless. And over and over again, these are the names that you are hearing and that are ringing in your ears and in your hearts. And desperately, all of us are trying to, fee- to flee and to change our names. We're working hard. We're deceiving our way through life or doing whatever we can to prove that we are not those things and to validate our worth. But like Jacob, the reality is, is that it will not work. You cannot change your name on your own. You cannot get rid of those names. You cannot get rid of the fear of living in those names that you hate. You need something else like Jacob. You need an encounter with God too. But instead of a wrestling match, the way that we encounter God is through two wooden beings that he would carry one day and he would go up a hill called Calgary and he would be nailed and mocked and killed on that cross. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, took upon every name that we hate, every fear that haunts us, and every brokenness and sin in our world on that cross. He who knew no sin would become sin for us, but not in defeat. He would not be defeated because in three days, he would be our savior and king and defeat death once and for all. And with the name, with the name, church, above every name, that is at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee should bow on heaven and on earth and under the earth. This is the name of Jesus. So that if we truly encounter him in our desperation, in our weakness, and trust in his name, Jesus will also give you a new name and bless you. When you encounter the risen Lord, it will change your name forever. Jesus, because he who defeated death has defeated the greatest fear of all, of all of humanity. Instead, his perfect love displayed on that cross will encounter you and cast out all fear. In Jesus, your stories will be transformed from fear to confidence. You will no longer fear being unwanted because you are now chosen. You will no longer fear being worthless because now in Jesus you are so worthy. You will no longer fear being broken because now you are healed. You will no longer fear being a failure because in Christ you are victorious. You are no longer a slave to this world, to the things of life, because in Christ you are free and you are a child of the living God. You are loved, you are beautiful, you are blessed, and that is the name that Christ gives to each one of you who believe in him. And I believe that if you truly encounter God, this is an ongoing encounter, God will transform your stories of fear into stories of confidence. And this is the story of Jacob and many throughout scripture and many throughout the church of how God is bringing people from fear to confidence in him. Now before I close, let me just close with one thing. What I want you to notice is this one assignment actually that this story gives to us in verse 31. Look at verse 31. It says this. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penel, limping because of his hip. A pastor, Martin Lloyd-Jones, he once said this, what does a person look like who has truly met God? He walks with a limp. Don't miss this last piece here, church. Jacob would not be only given a new name, but he will forever live with a limp. Even walking with Esau here and bowing to him seven times, every single moment he's limping, and that limp reminds him of his encounter with God. It reminds him how weak he was, how afraid he was. It reminds him of his old name and his old ways. It reminds him that he wrestled with God and God didn't choose to overpower him at that moment, but graciously give him a new name and bless him. Church, my challenge to you as you walk out of this room and go into wherever God has called you is to not lose your limb. Do not forget where you came from. Do not forget what God has done in your lives. Do not hide even the thorns of the flesh, the things that afflict you every day. Do not be ashamed of the pain, the messiness, and the hardships in your life. Remember here, even the resurrected Christ, when he came to the upper room and revealed himself to the disciples on that day when he resurrected, 
He didn't hide his scars or the holes in his hands. Instead, he showed them to Thomas to see, I have in fact died. And in that same way, church, I'm not saying that you're supposed to just boast about your suffering every single day and post it on your Instagram feed every day. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is that in wisdom and with others, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. This is my prayer for you. This is my prayer for all of our churches. Let us be a church of authenticity and vulnerability, but yet confidently living with the limp, knowing that God's power rests upon us. Amen, church? Amen. Let me pray. Father, we, um, God, we are people who are so afraid. God, I pray that if we ever think that we're not like Jacob, God, I pray that you would humble us and remind us that we are very much like him, that we are in need of your grace, that we are afraid of the names that we carry, of the things in life. But God, I pray that more confidently today that we would be reminded that you have given us a new name because we believe in the name of Jesus that is above all other names and we trust in him and by your grace we can be free, free from fear, free from the names of this world. And I pray, O oh God, that you would give us a humble confidence to live out our lives with a limp in all phases that we do, in, within our marriages, within our relationships, within our workplaces, within our families, within um, our community, our church, or wherever else you've called us, God. I pray that we would boldly live in your grace and your love, but yet also be aware that we are broken people too, looking to save others who have broken stories. It's in Jesus' name we pray.